Hello and welcome to the third screencast tutorial on using MorphoJ for uh, geometric morphometric analysis. So in the last tutorial, we took the 15 landmark data, we did a Procrustes superposition in the data, and we also imported an outline file and generated a, a wireframe um, to help us do visualizations. But yet, we haven't yet seen how any of this works. So what we're actually going to do now is do several simple analyses in um, particular, something called a um, principal components analysis to allow us to start looking at variation in the data in a variety of different ways. So we're going to again go back to uh, you need to make sure that the uh, data frame uh, data frame itself, the Drosophila species sexual dimorphism data set, is highlighted. And then what we're going to do, and of course we've already uh, generated our classifiers from the first tutorial, so we don't need to do anything else there. So what we're going to do now is go to this generate covariance matrix. So the first step in doing the principal components analysis is converting the raw land or the superimposed landmarks into uh, the covariance matrix for such landmarks. So we're going to generate the covariance matrix. You'll get a dialog box like this that opens. Data set selected, well, the one we only have one, which is Drosophila species sexual di dimorphism one. So we'll keep that selected. And the data type that we're going to use here is the Procrustes coordinates. We don't need to worry about these options right now, although later this may be worthwhile, is looking at what happens if we uh, do within group covariances. So we, we uh, adjust for aspects of uh, size uh, of, of species or sex, and these can be important for certain analyses. But for here, we're not going to do anything. We're just going to leave those as the default, although you could click on those uh, to, to change things if you wanted to, and we will just hit execute. And so we now get a covariance matrix, and likely uh, in the reports it'll just say a new co covariance matrix was generated, uh, told you about it, but it hasn't shown you anything uh, here. It's possible, I can't remember, even in here you can't even directly look at it uh, in the results, although in m most programming languages you'd be able to directly look at that covariance matrix. Of course, in this case it's a um, uh, 30 by 30 uh, dimensional matrix, and it's 30 by 30 because we have 15 two-dimensional landmarks, 15 by 2. Although, as we will discuss in class, we actually don't have 30 dimensions of data, we actually only have 26 dimensions of data uh, after Procrustes superimposition. We've lost two degrees of freedom for uh, location, uh, so basically centering the data, one degree of freedom uh, of data for scaling to centroid size, and a final degree of freedom for the actual uh, rotation, the generalized least squares rotation that we call the Procrustes superimposition itself. In any case, now we're going to take that covariance matrix and we're going to go to the variation um, window here. Um, and the first thing, is go principal components analysis. And so you click on that, and voila, the first thing that you're going to do is actually show you a plot. It knows what you want to do. And we'll look at a couple other things in the first case. And it's just showing you what are sometimes called lollipop graphs, where the points here, the I guess the lollipop part of the lollipop, uh, is the dot, and the bar, or what you would, what you'd hold, represents the shape change. In this case, the, uh, the principal components analysis this is showing us what uh, the first principal component looks like, so the axis of most variation. Uh, in general, for a lot of shape data, this reflects uh, overall size variation, and this is probably no exception here, although we have to investigate that. Um, the other plots that we get here, we're still in the graphics dialog, um, is the decomposition of, of the different dire uh, directions, what we call the eigenvectors, and keep in mind these are all independent of one another, or what we call orthogonal. Um, and explain how much of the overall phenotypic variation in the whole data set is explained by each direction. So that first principal component explains almost 30% of all of the variation among all of the observations. The next axis variation, which is statistically independent or orthogonal to that first axis, axis explains about 20 and so on. You see, of course, there's diminishing returns. And really, you can almost see here that by the time you hit about five dimensions, you've really covered about almost 80 odd percent, 85 percent of, of the overall variation, and we'll probably can look at that directly in, in the reports uh, section. The final figure that we can look at 
is the PC scores. And this is showing, in this case, the first principal component against the second principal component and where each observation lies. Now this is a good one to know how to do a couple of other important changes in terms of graphing. If you right click here, you can choose what principal components you want to look at. So if you want to look at principal components one and two or three and four, so we could easily change this to PCs three and four, uh, two and three. Um, but let's change that back to uh, one, one and two. Uh, the other thing that we can do is color the data. And in general, by the way, use same scaling for both axes. That means that these are on the same scale. So you can, uh, when principal component one varies more, you can you can see that more clearly in in these uh, in the position of these points. What I wanted to show you here um, is we can also color the data points. And among the ways we can color them are for things like species or sex. We have not currently created a variable that species by sex, but we'll do that shortly. So let's, in this case, just classify by species. Uh, so we should have about eight different colors. And then lo and behold, and not surprisingly, we see that, uh, say, all the individuals who are Seychellia here, this sort of light blue here, cluster together with each other. So they all belong. Uh, similarly, when you look at Melanogaster, which is uh, this one of these faded greens. I can't even tell which one it is here, but they tend all to be together. Simulans is all together and so on. So that each of these different species we see strongly clusters. This uh, may not always occur. Um, will depend on how uh, genetically uh, distant and phenotypically distant some of these species are. Um, but this is not an uncommon pattern by any means. We can similarly say, okay, well, how about with sex? Do we see any overall pattern with sex? And actually, we do, you can see sort of a, a shifting of the red and the blue. However, it's not directly on PC1 and PC2. It may be, in fact, fun to ask, okay, well, what happens if we look at PC3? Do they separate out any better? Not really. So that's something we'll come back to uh, at a later date, looking at, at that separation. But you can definitely see that we know from before that these are all Seychellia. You can see that once you take into account species, that sex does definitely separate. Going back to this first plot, what it's basically saying is that variation on principal component one here, let's actually uh, color, recolor these data points by species since that was clearly uh, one of the most dominant features was species level separation on both principal component one and principal component two. Um, so if we go back here, this is giving us a visualization of what it means like to move from one side of that axis to the other. So if you happen to be an observation over on this side of PC1 to this side, this is the shape change that you're observing going from negative to positive values. Uh, we can actually set the scale factor to make the, these uh, changes bigger or smaller. Uh, again, that's just a visualization tool because some, for some changes they'll be very, very small and hard to see. We can also change the type of graph that were observed. There's three ones that are available here. One would be a transformation grid. This is just a standard thin plate spline grid. Uh, which some people find a nice visualization. I personally don't find them um, that valuable by themselves, but we can also add uh, the outline here. So this is that outline file that we we uh, we got from the tutorial and we talked about in the previous tutorial. Uh, and this is showing you some of the shape changes as associated with variation along PC1. So basically what we're seeing is that PC1, by and large, the variation seems to be going from a longish narrow wing to a somewhat broader wing as we can see here so going from say here to here is going from essentially a narrow like wing to a broad wing now obviously that's not the whole changes there's more to it than just going from narrow to broad there's also real shifting of other points but it provides a visualization this again might be one to to set the scale factor to make it easier or harder to see see the shape changes um, so that gives you an idea of the outline we can also use that wireframe we created to do the same thing. And here's that wireframe. And this is, again, going to show that same sort of information, uh, in this case, with a somewhat simpler visualization. So because we happen to have the outline here, uh, the outline file is probably the easiest to actually see the changes. Please do, though, keep in mind there is no actual biological information for the specimens for the curves. For this particular representation, we have not done semi-landmark, so there is no information there. So the last thing we'll, we'll talk about here is looking at the results section. Um, 
if you go into the results, it actually has the principal components analysis. It basically tells you the magnitude of each of the eigenvalues associated with the principal components. Um, the magnitudes by themselves in this first column here called eigenvalues is often not useful by itself without some in information. What you can get from it is how much variance. So the, this first eigenvalue, 0 0.0025, represents about almost 30% of all the variations. So if you added up all of these eigenvalues, this first one, this, this one divided by the sum of all of them would be essentially 0.29 or 29%. The next one would be 22% and so on. And you can look in this uh, last column at the cumulative ones and we see the first five, <clears throat> excuse me, principal components explain over 80% of the variation. That's a fair bit of it. Often we want to go a little bit higher, but even if we want up to 95% of the variation, we still only need to use the first 13 out of 26 dimensions. So basically we can cut how many effective dimensions we really even need to consider almost in half. This also has uh, a couple of other um, bits of information that we'll come back to afterwards. So the variance of the eigenvalues here, this is essentially a measure of what we call the eccentricity, um, what the shape of the covariance matrix is essentially. Um, and then we actually have what are called the loadings for the principal components analysis down here below, but we won't discuss that uh, here. And we will leave this, uh, this is where we'll leave off with this tutorial, where we've discuss the basics of just visualizing the principal components analysis to see uh, the PC scores, the eigenvalues, and the shape changes associated with uh, various principal components. So here's PC2, for instance. Um, and I think that we will leave it there.